The Justice League is one of the most influential and iconic teams in all of comics. Their escapades and stories of heroism have been keeping generations of readers and viewers entertained for decades. Well, what if I told you that in the late 2000s, we almost got a Justice League movie that would have kickstarted an entire DC Cinematic Universe that would have run concurrently to the Dark Knight trilogy? Well, that's the movie we'll be discussing today as we break down the development, plot, and cancellation of the first ever planned Justice League movie, Justice League Mortal. The year was 2007, and it was a tumultuous time for DC Comic-based films. Before the first week of February had come and gone, their plans for a Joss Whedon Wonder Woman movie and a David Goyer Flash movie had both fallen through. On its own, this one-two punch of news was definitely bad, but less than a year prior, Superman Returns, their intended franchise soft reboot, had also underperformed based on Warner Brothers' lofty expectations. Their attempts at bringing DC Comics to the big screen was, for the most part, a series of false starts, critical failures, and financial disappointment for the previous decade and change. The only exception to this was the work that Christopher Nolan was doing with his Batman movies. But other than that, Warner Brothers and DC pretty much had nothing else in terms of crowd-pleasing blockbuster franchises. It was against this backdrop that the first news broke about any sort of movement on a Justice League movie. On February 22nd of that year, Variety broke the news that not only was Warner Brothers developing the movie, but that they also brought on the husband and wife writing team of Michelle and Kieran Mulroney to crack the story. By early June, the couple had submitted their script, titled Justice League Mortal, to a really positive reception at Warner Brothers. The studio fast-tracked the movie's production, hoping to get cameras rolling before November of that year, just in case the Writers Guild of America wasn't able to renew their contracts, because if that happened, Warner Brothers would technically no longer be able to employ the Mulroonies, or for that matter, any writer, which would obviously be a major challenge. This movie was intended to be the launch pad for individual character spin-offs and sequels, something new, a fresh start. When the movie was announced, it was a big question as to whether Christian Bale and Brandon Routh, the current on-screen Batman and Superman respectively, would be involved. But keeping in line with this new fresh start approach, neither of them were even asked. To that end, Christopher Nolan was publicly adamant that he would vastly prefer Warner Brothers delay the movie until he finished his final movie in the Batman trilogy. And Christian Bale took it one step further, stating, It'd be better if it doesn't tread on the toes of what we're doing, though I feel that it would be better if it comes out after Batman 3. There was even a time where Warner Brothers considered making the movie as an animated feature using motion capture in the vein of 2007's Beowulf, as to not confuse audiences with two different on-screen Batman and Superman. The studio's original pick to direct the movie was Jason Reitman, though he turned it down, wanting for the time to stay as a director of smaller indie films. But on September 20th, it was reported that the movie found its director in George Miller, the visionary behind the Mad Max and Happy Feet franchises. That October, Miller started holding auditions. He was hoping to cast younger actors, with the intention that they'd grow into their roles over the course of the franchise. By the time casting was over, DJ Cotrona was cast as Superman, Army Hammer was Batman, Megan Gale as Wonder Woman, Adam Brody as The Flash, Hugh Case Byrne as Martian Manhunter, Common as Green Lantern, Santiago Cabrera as Aquaman, Jay Baruchel as the film's main villain Maxwell Lord, Teresa Palmer as secondary villain Talia al Ghul, Zoe Kazan as Iris Allen, and Anton Yelchin as Wally West. The movie was set to film at Fox Studios Australia in Sydney, so many of the key players made their way down to Australia for rehearsals, training, and getting fitted for costumes. Miller saw them as a unit, a company of actors, and tried to keep them together in Sydney as much as possible. The result was a cast and crew that really bonded in their time down there, and by all accounts, they were having a total blast. They were pushing the envelope of what a DC movie could be, in terms of scope, but also aesthetically, as Army Hammer would later recall. We got down there and George Miller was basically like, we're going to push these DC people farther than they are ever going to be comfortable with. And then the DC people showed up and looked around and they were like, this is farther than we're comfortable with. <laughs> but we love it and you can do whatever you want. And then it just went even farther. This pushing farther than far attitude seemed to be the guiding force of the production. And they seemed to be nearly ready to go in front of cameras. Years later, Jay Baruchel, while reminiscing about his time in Sydney, would have this to say. 
And at that point, they had built so much of the movie. They had all the costume design. They had all the previs. They had all of the sort of production design figured out. And so they would take us and walk us through this um, yeah, command center where they had everything, all of the art up. And, and the, the aesthetic choices that they were making and the story and character choices they were making are so ballsy and we won't ever see it. Everybody seemed to be in love with this project, but just as fast as it came together, it began to fall apart. But before we get to why, let's take a deep dive into the film's plot. Our story begins in Metropolis. Superman, wearing an all-black suit, descends upon a vast cathedral surrounded by crowds of those in mourning. He enters the church, eyes fixed on a coffin in the front. He passes what seems like endless rows of civilians in mourning, until he meets nearly the entire Justice League in the front row, also dressed in black, mourning their fallen friend. This team is made up of familiar faces, but there is one notable face missing from this iconic lineup. Batman. Barry Allen, the hero known as The Flash, and his wife Iris are enjoying a meal at his favorite chain restaurant, Planet Krypton, in Central City. Unbeknownst to them, they're being watched by a satellite called Brother Eye. It orbits Earth, scanning for metahumans. Down in the Batcave, Bruce Wayne sits in front of a massive monitor, an infrared image of The Flash along with all of his information, location, associates, powers, identity, and most importantly, weaknesses, appear on the screen. Batman continues his scan, checking in on Superman, Green Lantern, Wonder Woman, and Martian Manhunter before, at the behest of his butler Alfred, he leaves the cave to attend his surprise birthday party. Bruce mingles with his wealthy socialite party guests and eventually strikes up a conversation with a familiar face, Maxwell Lord. Bruce teases him for catering the party with food from one of his business ventures, Planet Krypton. But Max laughs and tells Bruce that his restaurants have served over a million customers worldwide, and the whole world can't be wrong. Meanwhile, John Jones, the Martian Manhunter, disguised in his earthly form as a cop, investigates a rail yard in Denver, only to find a murky jar of liquid. Upon inspecting it in his car, an alien-looking aquatic creature pops out and spits on him. His skin starts to smoke before he bursts into flames and speeds away in his car. Back at the restaurant, Barry and Iris watch a newscast from Denver about fires erupting all over the city. The biggest one coming from a car that was on fire crashing into a fuel depot at Denver International Airport. Barry looks to Iris, seeking permission. Resigned, she playfully tells him, you can't save the whole world, you know. They kiss, and Barry takes off. He speeds across America before leaping into action at Denver International. Wonder Woman eventually shows up to help, and The Flash, who's the only hero who's never really met any of the others before, is starstruck. They manage to put out the fires before finding its source. Martian Manhunter, still on fire. They put him out, but he immediately bursts into flames again. Back at the party, Max and Bruce are both transfixed by the haunting beauty of one Talia al Ghul. Her and Bruce have a past. As Bruce begins to drown in that passionate memory of them together, Max's nose begins to bleed. Alfred snaps Bruce out of it though by pulling him aside and informing him that Brother Eye picked up Martian Manhunter being attacked by his weakness, fire. Wonder Woman and Flash take the Martian to her rooftop apartment in New York City and submerge him in her bathing pool before Superman arrives. As they try to figure out what exactly attacked John, Superman latches onto the idea that the creature was aquatic and decides to go ask Aquaman if he may know anything about this. Barry splits off from the team and returns home to find that his visiting nephew, Wally West, has already arrived. Not only is Wally just as fast as his uncle, but he's also really smart. Barry has a hunch that some sort of nanotech may be causing John's combustion problem, so he asks Wally to dig up anything he can find about what companies and militaries are using that kind of technology. As Batman and Alfred ponder how somebody could have discovered Martian Manhunter's weakness, we see Max sitting in his control room in New York, watching an infrared readout of Batman. Max, unbeknownst to Bruce, has taken control of Brother Eye. Not only that, him and Talia al Ghul are in cahoots. 
Superman makes his way to Aquaman's palace, and Arthur is agitated, believing that Superman is accusing him of attacking Martian Manhunter. Superman de-escalates the situation, but Arthur still refuses to help, motioning towards his left hand, made completely of water, a sobering reminder of the price he paid helping land dwellers. Superman eventually does convince Arthur, though, when he tells him that Wonder Woman, who he has a soft spot for, also requested his help. Meanwhile, Batman chases down a biker gang, dispatching them one by one. He corners the final goon in a Gotham City movie theater behind one of the screens before the thug disappears into the darkness, and out of the shadows emerges a metallic, airborne adversary, Omac Alpha. They eventually burst through the movie screen, but it's not much of a battle. The Omac trounces Batman, picking him up by the throat, about to kill him, as Talia and Max watch this happen from his control room. She begs Max not to kill Bruce, and Max complies because for him, this wasn't about killing Bruce Wayne, this was just about seeing how easy it would be to take everything away from him. As the OMAC leaves, Bruce sees it disintegrate, dropping the final goon back out of its shell. He returns to the Batcave and tries to use Brother Eye to find out what exactly attacked him, only to find out that he's locked out, his monitor reading five words. You don't control it anymore. Back at Wonder Woman's penthouse, a metallic mosquito appears and bites Aquaman right on the neck. His eyes grow wide as he backs up from Wonder Woman's pool and rips his prosthetic hand off. Arthur is now consumed by a fear of water. Wonder Woman takes him to another room, and between sharp, panicked breaths, he tells Diana that his hand might actually be able to help Martian Manhunter. John touches it, and his entire body is enveloped in a thin layer of water, no longer in flame. Meanwhile, John Stort, the Green Lantern, sits in his office on the 49th floor of the Empire State Building. He reviews some architectural work and chews on the end of his pencil before recoiling. Something tastes funny. Before he can even finish the thought, his tongue turns black, an intense white noise erupts in his ears, and his eyes writhe in their sockets. He's blind. The green light from John's ring lights up the windows of his office. This catches the attention of our heroes across town, who go and retrieve him. The heroes quickly conclude that nowhere is safe, and Superman suggests that they go hide out in the super secret location that is the Fortress of Solitude. Barry returns home to tell Iris and Wally where he's going. Iris gives Barry a cell phone and tells him it makes her feel safe if he has it on him. Before repeating her previous sentiment, don't do anything stupid. You can't save the whole world, you know. Barry smiles and tells her, not the whole world, just the little part with you in it. He blows her a kiss and leaves. The next day, our heroes arrive in the Fortress of Solitude. They pass statues of Lara and Jor-El, hundreds of feet high, until they get deep into the heart of Superman's base, where there's an exact replica of the Kent family farm. In the Batcave, Bruce and Alfred use backup computers to dig up info on the OMAC project and find out that it was intended to be a super soldier program back in World War II. But in the 60s, they switched it from physical combat suits to mind control before eventually transitioning into nanotech before the entire program was discontinued in 1999. This research is interrupted when Batman notices that the Brother Eye has managed to locate the Fortress of Solitude and everyone inside. He immediately drops what he's doing and makes a beeline for the bat plane. Meanwhile, Barry tries to keep the afflicted heroes occupied by asking them about their powers. Before long, they start asking about his. While some of the others see their powers as a burden, Barry sees it as a gift. How when he's really cooking, the universe stops. How between the beats of the human heart, there's peace. Everybody is hanging on his every word before Martian Manhunter asks him if he could run at the speed of light. The Flash tells him that he's gotten close, but he doesn't think he can. How he thinks that the speed barrier is a one-way trip. The conversation is interrupted by Batman arriving and telling them that they're not safe here. He lays it all out. A satellite is tracking them, he built it, and that he doesn't know who took control away from him. Naturally, all the heroes are furious at him, but Batman explains that he never planned on using it. It only existed for the off chance that somebody started controlling one of them. A countermeasure had to be put in place for that what if. He tells them to split up, but Superman disagrees, telling him that they're stronger united. Batman disagrees and tells them what he knows about the OMAC program and turns to leave. As he does, the Flash's phone rings. He flips it open to talk to Iris, and as he does, a metallic probe jumps from the phone and into his ear. 
His body begins to vibrate, so fast in fact that he begins to pass through the earth. After a trip through the center of the earth and back, Diane is able to grab him with her lasso to keep him at the fortress. Martian Manhunter is able to guide the blind Green Lantern to surgically remove the Nanite from Flash. Seeing that these effects are indeed reversible, Superman scans Martian Manhunter to see that there are no nanites inside of him. Whatever he has, it's all on his skin. Flash suggests that he takes his removed nanite home to check out how it works. Diana agrees, but tells him that she'll go with him, because he isn't back at full strength yet. Superman rockets off into space to try and locate the brother eye satellite, and the two Johns stay back to perform their next surgery on Arthur. As the Batplane returns home, Alfred contacts Bruce to tell him that he was able to patch back into Brother Eye. He asks Alfred to see if there's a file on him in the system, and sure enough, there is. He asks Alfred what it lists as his weakness. One word towers above Alfred, 30 feet high on the monitor. Love. As Batman takes this in, we get flashes of all of his past loves. Julie Madison, Silver St. Cloud, Vicki Vale, Catwoman, Poison Ivy, and finally, Talia. We flash back to six months ago, Batman and Talia's last night together. We learn here that Talia transferred a nanoscopic homing device to Batman orally during their final smooching session. The Flash and Wonder Woman return to planet Krypton only for Barry to scarf down as much food as he can to regain his strength. Wally West meets them there with a folder and tells him that he dug up a bunch on the OMAC project. But most critically, he points out that there was only one survivor from the phase when they were testing out mind control, a child by the name of Jonah Wilkes, or as everybody knows him now, Maxwell Lord. Batman tracks down Talia, which leads him to find both her and Max at his control room in New York. He confronts them, and Max activates the first phase of this new OMAC project. Around the world, people in seats of power, the wealthy, military people, the people who were at Bruce Wayne's birthday party begin to transform. Max traps Bruce, torturing him, using him as bait for the others to arrive. Superman and Martian Manhunter are able to hear Bruce's pain struggle, and at that moment, Martian Manhunter telepathically communicates with everybody to go save Batman. Superman and Wonder Woman arrive to Max's base. They destroy the OMAX guarding Batman, and Wonder Woman begins to argue with Max, telling him to turn the OMAX off. As they go back and forth, Max begins to bleed out of every orifice of his head. He smiles. Just then, Superman delivers an annihilating blow to Wonder Woman from behind. She then realizes, mind control. Max is controlling Superman. Max smirks and tells Wonder Woman that Superman now believes that she tortured and killed his true love, Lois Lane. Superman and Wonder Woman engage in a knockdown dragout death match. Superman throws Max's cars at her, they burst through ceilings and walls, and even at one point, fight in space. Aquaman, Green Lantern, and Martian Manhunter, who are now back at fighting strength after using their powers to fix each other's various afflictions, eventually show up and stall Superman. Wonder Woman returns to Max and asks him how to turn all of this off. Max smiles and says that there's only one way to stop this. Kill him. At this point, Wonder Woman is at war with herself. She ties the lasso around Max's neck, but ultimately can't bring herself to do it. She drops the lasso and braces herself for what will probably be her final round with Superman. When out of nowhere, Batman pops up behind Max, snaps his neck, and watches his lifeless body fall to the ground. Superman snaps out of it, sees what happened, what he did, and comes to a sobering realization. Batman was right to have those contingencies to stop everybody. Just then, wires unsuspectingly enter Talia's body like tendrils, her consciousness now merged with Brother Eye. Immediately, regular people by the thousands begin to transform into Omax, and our heroes question how any of this could be happening. Talia, now as Brother Eye, begins to speak. Her voice is a combination of hers and Max's. All Max did was give the people what they needed. Dinner. All at once they put it together. There were nanites in Planet Krypton's food, like Max said. Over a million served. A message pops onto the computer screen behind Talia. Commence OMAC War. The Flash, who is fending off OMAX in all of the world's various capitals, returns to his friends, ready for round two. They go to the roof of the building, preparing themselves for the oncoming onslaught, except for Batman. He rips the wires out of Talia. The machine shuts off, but Talia also begins to fade. In her dying breath, she tells Bruce that Max's consciousness is now moving looking for a host that's stronger than a regular human that normally powers an OMAC. 
As the Omax Swarm draws closer, Wally West appears to aid in battle. Flash objects, but he eventually allows him to join since they're shorthanded. Batman joins them on the roof, and for the first time, the entire Justice League is united, ready for anything. Batman tells the team to watch out for a bigger Omac. Whatever Max transfers to, it will be much badder than the rest of them. As those words leave Batman's lips, they turn to see the Flash, Planet Krypton's biggest fan, transform into a bigger, badder Omac. Omac Ultra. Superman battles the Ultra one-on-one -on -one as the other members fend off the seemingly endless swarm. He's about to deliver the killing blow when Batman intervenes, telling him that Flash is still alive inside and that it's feeding off of his life energy. Some of the team manages to hold the Ultra down. Martian Manhunter gets into Flash's mind and he and Wally manage to wake up Flash inside the machine. He can't turn it off from the inside, but he does have one idea. He vibrates faster and faster until he pops out of the OMAC shell into a world where time is completely stopped. The Flash has entered the Speed Force. It's peaceful. It's quiet. He knows what needs to be done. He runs back home to find Iris frozen on the couch. The last fragment of a moment that he'll ever see his eternal love. He can't tell her goodbye, so he just tells her, Turns out I can save the whole world. I can. And so that's what I'm gonna do. Because you're in it. Tears roll down Flash's cheeks. They're the only thing moving in the entire universe. He puts his hand on Iris' heart, and we see tears starting to pool in each eye. He steps out onto the porch and takes in the beautiful evening that's falling. His last moment in this beautiful world. Time space folds as he snaps back onto the rooftop in New York. Still inside the OMAC Ultra, the Flash takes off, destroying every last OMAC shell running all around the world at impossible levels of speed, faster and faster until the Flash breaks out of the Ultra Shell, pulling the shattered molecules behind him like a comet's tail. The world eventually begins to dissolve around him. He runs even faster, and the world stretches on into what seems like forever. Before, by his side, he sees Wally, who tells him he's going too fast. He'll never make it. Barry gives a knowing smile to his nephew and playfully tells him, Tag, you're it. Barry breaks the very limit of speed, shattering the speed barrier full force, taking OMAC Ultra with him. Time returns to normal as every OMAC shell disintegrates simultaneously. Wally stands there broken and tells the others what happened. They hear a rip in space-time as the Flash's red costume falls from the sky onto the roof. Barry Allen, the Flash, is gone. The night of Barry's funeral, Batman goes to his grave, drowning in overwhelming guilt. This wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for him. He throws a single rose in the hole and tells him, Godspeed, Flash. Barry Allen. Godspeed. The next day, at the Fortress of Solitude, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, Aquaman, and Martian Manhunter want to form a team. Wally is hesitant, but eventually accepts as the Superman, who still feels horrible about how he basically maimed all of his friends under mind control. Batman, though, turns it down. He's not a god like them. He's just human. But Superman tells him that that's not just his greatest strength, that's the team's greatest strength. And Batman accepts. He and Superman shake hands, a firm commitment to the future. Wally calls over to everybody else. On Superman's space monitor, he sees Starro the Conqueror descending towards Earth. They look around, and without a word, the Justice League, strong and determined, gear up and launch themselves through outer space with one mission, to keep us safe. I absolutely love this story. I feel like it's the perfect top-level introduction to all of these characters that makes you want to see their further adventures. My favorite part about this script is that it reminds me a lot of the Justice League cartoon from the 2000s. Not just in tone, but in the sense that it feels like a universe that we're just looking in on. That if this movie was made or not, it feels like this universe exists somewhere. With this story in place, things started taking shape. That raises the question, between an energized cast and a bold visionary behind the lens, why did it get canned? 
Despite the incredible amount of headway made on the movie, there was still the matter of the writer's strike. According to Army Hammer, The writer's strike was looming, so what we did is we all sat down at a table before we knew it was going to happen. I mean, almost like, we're like, we have two hours. And they're like, so just throw every idea we can into the script, because we can't write the script once it starts. Right. And everybody just sat around spitballing with George and Nico and all the whole creative team down there. And we ended up with a script that was almost 200 pages long. And then someone goes, okay, five, four, three, all right, guys, that's the writer's strike. Pens down, no one can write anything else. The second the writer's strike began, the movie, now with its new, expanded script, had to be put on indefinite hold. The strike stretched on for a few months, and as 2007 turned into 2008, seeing no end in sight for the strike, Warner Brothers had to make the difficult decision to release all of the actors from their contracts, presumably with the intention to re-sign them once the movie went back into production. Some actors found out later than others, but the most heartbreaking story was that of DJ Katrona. He received the call that he was being released as the car that Warner Brothers sent to drive him to the airport to take him back to Sydney was pulling into his driveway. But the strike ended on February 12th. On that same day, the movie was revived. The Mulroonies returned to revise their script and presumably whittle down its now almost 200 pages to something a bit more digestible, a task that they had six weeks to do. Miller wanting to make the movie in his home country of Australia worked out well for Warner Brothers because they would have gotten a massive tax break on the movie. The crew was majority Australian and three of the main cast members were also Aussies. But the Australian Film Commission denied Warner Brothers the tax break. What's worse is that when the commission voted on whether or not they'd be getting it, it was struck down by just a single vote. This obviously frustrated Miller and Warner Brothers, and that February, they decided to set up the movie at Vancouver Film Studios in Canada. The team behind the movie hoped to jump right back into production as soon as possible, but it was pushed back another three months with the intention to film in July of 2008. That July came around, and the movie still didn't go in front of cameras. Warner Brothers didn't seem to mind though, because that month also saw the release of The Dark Knight. The movie broke the all-time opening weekend box office record, had a spectacular reception, and would go on to gross a billion dollars. At that point, Warner Brothers figured, why risk $300 million making Justice League with a Batman who wasn't the beloved Christian Bale, alongside characters that were essentially new to general audiences? Warner Brothers also feared that if the movie was bad, it would risk damaging the momentum that the Batman movies had generated. The success of The Dark Knight made Warner Brothers turn their attention back to making movies about individual characters. In the preceding years, any mention of Justice League Mortal seemed sparse to non-existent as development of those standalone movies ramped up, before Warner Brothers began working on a totally new and separate Justice League movie that, ironically enough, would also get cancelled. In addition to the writer's strike and the tax complications, this new focus on the individual character movies in the wake of The Dark Knight's success was the third strike for Justice League. And I think that's a total shame because this movie would have been awesome. A sprawling epic that also gave us these touching character moments. Between Miller's eye for action and character, I don't see how this film could have been anything less than wildly entertaining. But that's the story of Justice League Mortal and the end of yet another episode of Canned Goods. So until next time, thank you so much for watching, be good to each other, and stay Hemmas.